What obstacles did the Imagineers face in order to bring back this attraction? What obstacles? There weren't that many obstacles. I think it was a combination of knowing that we would have a nostalgia fan base for this show that would love to see this, would love to have something that they grew up with brought back to Disneyland. We do that all the time. We just brought back the Finding Nemo associated with bringing the submarines back. We brought back the castle with new special effects in it. And we just created a new version of Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln. So we knew that. I think what we were kind of excited and nervous about is whether young people today would fall in love with the character and, and the journey of Captain Nemo, or Captain EO, the same way that uh, the previous generation, their parents did. And what was exciting to me today in watching the guests arrive, there are so many young people, so many teenagers, so many early 20s that would have only been you know, less than 10 years old when this was gone, or not even here. And they have all been very, very excited about this. And, and, and it seems like to work. It seems like the music and the story and the message is working with this generation as much as it was those who enjoyed it the first time around. So Walt had a formula. He used to cycle the, the films, his feature films, into the wall and bring them back out. I think that works with our attractions. We were really concerned back in the 80s to make Disneyland relevant. There was kind of a, a dry spell at, uh, you know, in the Disney company with the popular culture. And we weren't kind of in sync. This was when Star Wars and Indiana Jones and E.T. And so we formed a partnership with George Lucas back then. And the first thing that came out of that because we needed something quick was not the ride Star Tours, which we had gone to George about, but it was Captain Neil because we could get it here about a year sooner. So this was the first of a real partnership that I think brought Disney and Disneyland uh, concurrent with a generation that was going growing up at that time. And did you expect this kind of big media hype? We didn't know uh, what to expect. We, we had to plan because if you don't plan, then sure enough, thousands of people come and it's anarchy. So the park was on, uh, you know, on preparation for, you know, handling a massive crowd if they came. And so it did start to pile up right before the opening. We had a huge, you know, uh, group that was waiting to see the show. So uh, I think we were prepared for it. They were orderly and they got into the theater. I think we had all the seats. Everybody got into that performance and it waited diligently out front. So it was orderly, but it was exciting because they all had uh, special outfits and things that they had done and it was really fun to see the variety and age groups that had responded to this return. Uh, oh, this is just for me, but uh, any uh, chance of getting the original journey into imagination back? <laughs> well, anything is possible. I, you know, the thing that's exciting that kind of sort of the, the reason we started to look at this potential of bringing back and, you know, we actually have films from the 50s like Working for Peanuts and The Mouseketeer Jamboree and all that that are in 3D. Um, there's a tremendous resurgence and almost uh, excitement about 3D today that is higher than it has ever been and we're starting to see stories told in 3D. And so Disney kind of, I think, was a pioneer in that, both in the 50s with working for the Peanuts with a, the Chippendale and the Mouseketeer Jamboree and then with Magic Journeys being the first kind of of the new wave yeah. 70 millimeter, followed by Captain Neo. So anything's possible. I'd love to do a 3D film festival at the Disney Shore. Uh, that'd be amazing. Which would be awesome. Yeah. You know?